Okay, it's seven o'clock. You want to kick it off? No, let's go for it. All right. Hey, everybody. Happy spring and welcome back to the 1455 author series. This is our monthly series, sometimes more than once a month, where we go deep with a particular author and their book. Uh, tonight, I am delighted to be joined by Gail Brandeis. I'll introduce her in a moment. Uh, I'm Sean Murphy. I'm the executive director of 1455. If this is your first time checking us out, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, in terms of who we are and what we do, very simply put, 1455 is a nonprofit that celebrates storytelling. And we do this uh, through year-round free programming. You can find out all kinds of stuff about what we do and what we're going to do and upcoming events at our website, which is 1455litarts.org. And before I introduce tonight's special guest, I do want to give a shout out, as I always do, to our very special friends and partners at DC's Historic Potter's House, which is a bookstore community center gathering space. Um, it's in the historic Adams Morgan neighborhood of Washington, DC. They've been around since 1960 and have been a key place for deeper conversation, creative expression, and community transformation. We encourage you to support them. And when you pick up your copies of tonight's book, support an independent bookseller. Potter's House is a great one. Um, but put your money where your mouth is, support our writers, support our independent booksellers. It's never been more important. Um, and after tonight, you're going to be running to order some books. So without further ado, let me introduce Gail. Her essays, poetry, and short fiction have been widely published in places including The Guardian, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Oh, The Oprah Magazine, The Rumpus, Salon, and more. She has received numerous honors, including the Columbia Journal Nonfiction Award, and she was named a writer who makes a difference by The Writer Magazine. She teaches at the low residency MFA programs at Antioch and the University of Nevada, Reno. She currently lives in Highland Park, Illinois, with her husband and youngest child. Gail, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. I'm so delighted to be here and want to share uh, my own love for independent bookstores. I hope to visit Potter House someday. Outstanding. Well, thank you for that. And we are here, of course, to talk about your collection, Drawing Breath. Uh, I was telling you right before we came on the air, uh, we try not to pick books we're not going to like, but it's always an extra bonus when I have the opportunity to spend time with a book that really moves me and inspires me. Um, rather than have me uh, sing its praises, let me read from the back cover uh, one of the blurbs, which I think sets the tone, uh, and I concur with this assessment. In Drawing Breath, Essays on Writing, the Body, and Loss, Penn Bellwether Prize winning writer Gail Brandeis's essays explore, among other things, the writing life and the embodied life along with a potent intersection between the two. From the title essay, investigating the connection between writing and breath, to the final essay, which delves into her experience with long-haul COVID and its impact on her creative voice, this collection is infused with the urgency of mortality, thrumming with grief, authenticity, and a deep love for both language and the world of the senses. Perfectly put, and um, I have a lot to say about this collection, but one thing I'll say, which should be becoming clear to everyone tuning in, there's a lot going on here, but it's all relevant. It's all beautifully expressed, and it really makes you think. Um, so I want to kick it off, if I may, by just noting that what you've done here, Gail, is I what I think is so successful about well-crafted essays, and that is when a writer is able to integrate the autobiographical with the historical, pulling in all the lovely details, like for instance, how a raspberry might resemble crystallized blood, which is a beautiful metaphor in one of the essays, and connecting the universal with the urgency of the personal so that people can either relate and or learn. Um, talk a little bit, if you'd like to, about the origins of this collection and how you describe it and what you're after here to people who haven't read it yet. 
Sure. Thank you so much for all those kind words, Sean. I'm more so to come. <laughs> grateful. Thank you for all of them. Um, this book feels like a bonus book in a way um, because the pieces were written individually without the thought of them being part of a larger book project. Right. Some of them are over 20 years old. And um, the essay form is one that I've come to love so much. As a kid, I grew up you know, writing poetry. I put together a little neighborhood newspaper, um, uh, wrote stories and various things. But the essay, I don't know. It just has been an undercurrent through all of it as well. And the essay is where I know myself most, I think, and where I am able to explore both the world inside me and the world outside me in a really deep way. And so these various essays uh, came to me because I had questions about things, because I wanted to explore different parts of my life, because I had images in my head that I needed to unpack. And at some point, I guess it was early in the pandemic when I was having trouble breathing and when I was having trouble writing because I had so much brain fog, I started thinking about all these essays I had written over the years and thought I, I could pull these together and see how they speak to one another. And when I did that, I realized how many uh, kind of threads have been pulsing throughout my writing life over these last 20 years or so. And the there were so many about the body, so many about loss, so many about writing itself. And they coalesced quite organically into a collection. Um, the title essay is one of the oldest essays in the book. It was actually my critical paper when I was getting my MFA and I wanted to explore the connection between writing and breath. Um, which is something that I had been curious about because I had been a dancer as well as a writer when I was younger. I still love to dance, but don't do it in any sort of serious way now. And as an undergraduate, my um, the degree I put together was in poetry and movement. And I found that the body was where those two arts intersected and breath became the that nexus between body and mind, between movement and writing. And so I just wanted to, to dig into that more deeply. Um, so that's what I did when I was getting my MFA, yeah. not realizing that 20 years later, it would be the title essay of an essay collection. Um, but breath, you know, because it, it, we take the world into our bodies when we breathe in and we breathe ourselves back out into the world when we breathe out, it feels like such a perfect metaphor for writing. And it became, just this metaphor for the whole book and various ways we can breathe and do breathe in the world. Yeah. And you set up the different uh, parts of the book through different types of breath. Um, you know, again, there, there's so many accolades that I, that I would bestow, but what, you know, I think one thing that separates the mature essayist from maybe the, the more novice is there's the inevitable inward gazing uh, that borders on the solipsistic what you're able to do and what great essayists are able to do is, is make it deeply personal. It's a very autobiographical form, but there's something, there, there has to be kind of thematic um, integrity. And what you do so well is you bring this, this depth of knowledge um, and, and how well-read you are. So the passion of the subjects comes through, but the reader is able to learn about you and learn about the topic at hand. And I think that that's a deceptively easy endeavor for readers or writers that aren't used to doing this. But I want to highlight that it's it's a very it, it, this kind of mastery only comes after, you know, having done a lot of it for a long time and, and realizing how to integrate these different threads in an effective way. Thank you. I love doing research. It's so delicious to me. And um, I you know, I love that as as a writer, I can go down whatever rabbit hole I want to, and it's often fruitful. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, being able to to do that searching in the world for the perfect you know, little factoid or detail um, is such a, a satisfying process for me. And I love to constantly push myself to constantly learn and to, yeah, weave what I learn into my work. I would say these essays read very felt, 
but they're very um, deeply thought through too. And, and again, a very ideal balance for the reader. Um, I think it's always a special treat to hear the author's own words and their own voice. So if you'd like to, to read an excerpt or a, one of the essays, I certainly would be delighted to hear you do that. Thank you so much. Sure. I think read the first essay in the collection, Portrait of the Writer as a Young Girl, which was originally written in first person, but I decided that third person felt better for it. The girl writes her first poem when she's four years old. Blow little wind, blow the trees little wind, blow the seas little wind, blow me until I am free little wind. Somehow, even at this young age, the girl knows writing can be a wind that blows through her, makes her more spacious inside, freer. She feels it from the very start. She'll still feel it decades later. The girl's favorite writing surface is the cardboard tucked into her dad's dress shirts when they come back from the dry cleaners. Some of the folded cling wrapped button downs are stacked inside the bone colored armoire in her parents' room. Others are stacked in the top shelf of the closet where her winter coats hang over her rubber boots. She slices the wrappers open with her finger and slides the pieces of cardboard out, the shirt slumping inside the plastic like a sigh. One side of the cardboard is slick and white and smells a little bit sour like paste. The other side is brown and rough, nubby like oatmeal and smells more like sawdust. She lies on her stomach on the living room rug and lists titles of stories she wants to write. Her crayon scuds across the white side, leaving waxy shreds in its wake. On the rough side, the crayon leaves a deeper, thicker tread. She feels her breath push into the carpet as her words push their way onto the stiff page. The ghosts of her father's shirt sleeves wrapped around it like a hug. The girl is shy. She makes her sister order for her at Arby's, rarely ever raises her hand in class, but when she writes, she's brave. She creates a neighborhood newspaper and interviews neighbors and sells subscriptions door to door. Writing is her superpower, the caped heart that flies inside her mild-mannered skin. The girl sees her mom write poison pen letters when she's upset about something. She watches the letter writing campaigns her mom spearheads change things, a traffic light installed at a dangerous intersection near her school, guns and ammunition removed from her local Kmart after some violence. The girl starts to write her own letters, letters to the editor railing at the teenage boys who throw rocks at ducks at the beach, at people who throw trash out the windows of their cars. She writes to President Carter to ask how she can stop pollution and receives a Keep America Clean pack in return. She gives the bright orange garbage bag, or she takes the bright orange garbage bags printed with Woodsy Owl, give a hoot, don't pollute, to the beach and picks up pop-up tabs and stray wrappers, knowing she has a presidential order to do so. She sends a letter in solidarity to Amy Carter after the first daughter gets in trouble for reading at a state dinner, and Amy Carter writes back. The girl texts the letter along with a photo of Amy Carter torn from a magazine over her bed. The girl's mom, Uncle Jimmy, who looks like W.C. Fields and lives in a men's hotel in Cleveland and pulls silver, silver dollars from her ears, tells her mom he's looking for someone to write his life story. The girl immediately offers, sure she can tackle the biography of a 76-year-old man who was raised in an orphanage and fed her mom bear meat when her mom was a girl. Jimmy writes back to let her mom know a child could never write his story. He wants his book to focus on women who performed unusual sexual acts. The girl has little understanding of what usual sexual acts even entail, but she's intrigued. She wonders if this is what people write about when they're grown. When the girl touches herself, she swirls words into the place between her legs, whatever words spring to mind, peanut, bird, Zamboni. She doesn't know this is about sex. These feelings are just a sweet gift from her body. Words and pleasure become intertwined, become the same thing. She's introduced to shame when her mom catches her and tells her to, she's too old to be doing such a thing. Body and mind start to split then, body and word. It will be quite a while before they're reunited. She'll later wonder what a transcript of all those words she ground into herself would say if she could somehow unspool it from her body, that list of words written on her most tender skin. 
The girl likes to write about what's hidden. Her series, The Elves and I, follows creatures who live in the drain pipe in front of her building. Her first novel, The Secret World, is a 20-page, thinly-veiled knockoff of her favorite book, The Secret Garden. Her teacher has it laminated and spiral-bound and put in the school library. It gets its own card in the card catalog, her name in the same wooden drawer as Judy Bloom's, her first taste of being a published author. The girl fills a plaid-covered anything book with short stories. In school days, a teacher has plastic surgery and turns psychotic. In Never Say Diet, an anorexic woman makes her whole family eat a diet of grapefruit and rice before she's rushed to the hospital. In Rocky, a girl tries to cope with going blind, aided by her trusty horse. The girl doesn't know she will write about these same themes, mental and physical illness, and the mysteries of the body the rest of her life. The girl stands at her bedroom window in her pink baby doll nightgown, a wisp of cotton candy nylon. The Humpty Dumpty lamp on her dresser is on. She knows people can see into her fifth floor window if they choose to glance up, can see this 10 year old girl who feels both younger inside and somehow much, much older. The building next to hers looks like a castle from the front, red brick, turrets, a sunken garden courtyard that she likes to sneak into, but from the side, it looks unfinished, a paler brick, exposed beams, stark concrete steps. The girl touches the yellow and white gingham drape that hangs by her side, the one that matches her bedspread, her puffy rocking chair, the yellow and white faux bamboo bedroom set. She knows she must glow in this window. She might even look sexy, whatever that means. The girl wants to understand the backs of things, the unfinished sides of things, the place where the castle ends and real life begins. She shifts her head so she can see like Michigan undulating across the street in the dusk, a pewter gray mirror. She wants someone to look up and see her. She wants to be seen, not just the front of her, the frothy pink, the princess, but behind that, the inside of her notebook, her soaring caped heart, the parts she's been warned to never show. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Gail. Well, I mean, it really is perfect. And I, you have to remind me that when was that essay written in relation to the to the rest of the book? This is a more recent one. I wrote it um, five or so years ago, something like that. It's such an ideal place setter because you really do introduce so many of the aforementioned themes. Um, you know, breath is obviously the through line and kind of the thematic um you know, running metaphor and examination, but there, there's so much, there's grief, there's body, there's uh, a lot of things that we'll get into, but I thank you for reading that. And I, when I first uh, was reading through this book, I was making questions about breath, but by the time I was done, I had dozens of questions about other things. So in the interest of trying to touch on as many of them as possible, I thought, what's one quote I can throw out that really nails this examination of breath. And I have to give you uh, so much kudos for sharing with your readers a line I had never read where you quote Robert Haas and the quote being, poetry is mortal breath that knows it's mortal. Um, I adore that so much. There's so much wonderful exposition on all things breathing, you know, physical, mental. Um, but talk a little bit about you know, how you examine breath both as a literal thing, which you do, and also the metaphorical properties and, and how that just informs so much creativity and, and sport and, and real, I mean, every endeavor. Yeah. Um, my gosh, breath, it's everything. <laughs> like I said before, it's, you know, it's something that goes into us and also comes out of us. And so it connects us to the world. It connects us to each other. It helps us connect with our bodies. If we pay attention to our breath or can help ground us in the moment, if we are feeling anxious, paying attention to our breath can bring us right into the moment, which is very helpful. And something that I have had to do many times when writing hard things is just come back to my breath to remind myself that I'm safe. I'm here in my body. I'm, I'm okay. I'm not in the traumatic place that I'm writing about. Um, so breath becomes this, this vehicle for connection because when we breathe in, we're breathing in molecules that so many other people and other animals and plants have breathed. 
um, we breathe ourselves out and, and other parts of the world that, you know, we can't even imagine are breathing molecules of us in. So it's this mode of connection. It's also a mode of transformation because when we change our breath, we change our state of being, whether we're holding our breath in awe or, yeah, just um, whatever sort of breathing exercise we do can completely change the, the mind as well as the body because it is at that intersection of mind and body. And I was thinking about how charged um, breath has become in the last few years with the Black Lives Matter movement and the racial reckoning that happened around George Floyd's death where um, over many years, the because of awful racialized deaths by, by the hands of police, um, the phrase, I can't breathe, has been used at many protests. And it just makes me think about how, even though there is this sense of connection with breath, it connects us to everyone. Not everyone has the same access to clean air that we do. So breath becomes also an issue of class, of race, of all sorts of things, um, because of course, you know, uh, industry is is put in areas of more um, underserved communities, and um, yeah, so so breath it becomes as it it's connected to everything. And yeah. I love uh, Mira Rukaiser's Rukaiser's quote where she says, "Breathe in experience, breathe out poetry," and yeah. I think to me that captures. You know, that interchange of self and world as we write. Thank you for that. Yeah, it really does. And and I, I think, you know, the whole concept of breath is so typically associated with physical activity. Um, it's so important, I think, for writers especially to consider the very things you're saying and how critical this is. And And for people that aren't aware of it, it's probably a very welcome reminder to pay more attention to all of those things um, because good things can come out of it, which leads me to the next uh, topic of sorts, which is which is totally connected, and that is the body, which you talk about a lot. Um, allow me, please, to pay you the compliment. I consider you a master of creative language and the pun. Uh, I won't give any away. I think the reader needs to get in here and see what I'm talking about. But arguably, nowhere is this more effectively utilized in the essay Thunder thighs, which is thunder, comma, thighs. Um, even as a man, I, I'm certainly not unfamiliar with the myriad ways that society assails a woman's self-image before they're even adolescents. Um, but this essay was so enlightening to me because it's such a perceptive interrogation of the real harm. Um, in many instances, this then becomes self-harm, literally and figuratively, through body image, and you take a deep dive, pardon the pun or whatever, the, the inelegant, you you go deep into the thigh. Talk a little bit about, you know, I, I suspect that that is what you were talking about when you, you certainly do your research, you're speaking from experience. But again, I think women are going to snap, snap when they just see the title. But it was very enlightening for me. And I think, of course, any man must read essays like this to get a better understanding of what's really going on. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've had a really complicated relationship with my thighs since I was a teenager. And I I find that if I write about things that trouble me or that, um, yeah, I have issues with that, it helps. It helps to, to write about things, it helps me release stuff. But I thought, I don't just want to write about my own experience. I want to explore, you know, the cultural history of thighs and the natural history of thighs <laughs> and also ask other women about their relationship with their thighs. And originally this was going to be a book project, um, but I lost steam on that and set aside my notes and it ended up, you know, just being an essay, which I think was the perfect form for this exploration. Um, I had sent questionnaires to a bunch of people asking about their relationships with their thighs, and the results were really both um, heartbreaking and um, moving and inspiring um, to see how women have come to peace with their own bodies, but have also struggled with their body image. 
Um, and weaving that together with things like, I, I was so excited to learn that in ancient Egypt, women would ask for the thighs of Hathor, which is a, a goddess who sometimes has the body of a cow. And, and that, you know, that this was a prayer to just like want the gorgeous, abundant thighs of Hathor. And I, I loved that. And just digging into where this um, sort of thigh anxiety stems from, how long it's been since uh, we've been told that there should be space between our thighs, the, the thigh gap. Um, yeah, I, I dug into all of it because I wanted to understand it. I wanted to push myself out of my own hangups around that part of my body. And I wanted to celebrate the part of the body too, because I had poured so much anxiety into it. I still do on occasion. I was hoping that writing this would make it go away forever, but it's, it still crops up um, just because we live in this patriarchal yeah. consumerist society where we're yeah. taught to feel bad about ourselves. Um, but this writing this did help and I, I will return to it to remind myself, um, yeah, just how amazing thighs are. <laughs> Indeed. Here, here. And, you know, Gail, I, I'll say that, of course, we want to read and we do read for pleasure. We want to read to be enlightened and informed. But I think for sensitive people and this demographic of ones that are the target audience for any type of essay or thought like this, it's also kind of this clarion call for us to remember it's our job to tell each other we're beautiful and to support each other. And, I, and I'll say that I'm I'm disappointed. I wish that writing this you'd been able to transcend some of these ridiculous societal constructs. However, you're doing the good work and paying it forward to celebrate women's beauty and women's bodies. And so it's it, it's doing the work for others to remember when you read work like this, we all have to pay it forward and, and make it a point to deconstruct the constructs that are that are purposely designed to set us down and, and keep us apart. Yeah, thank you. I find that when those like the negative self-talk rises up in me now, it's easier to silence it than it used to be. And I think that writing this helped a lot. And yeah, I do hope it's helpful for other people as well. I, I don't see how it couldn't be. And, and again, I want to say it both lightly, but but very sincerely as a as a male. Uh, deeply enlightening, deeply inspiring. So I'd like to think that for women in particular, some of these essays will really resonate and 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 be you know very helpful. Um, which leads us to another point I wanted to make, which is, and you talk about it a little bit, and you do it in the Thunder Thighs essay. But um, you are you are such a generous writer. Um, this book is replete with quotes. Uh, and comments by other writers, quoting from other writers' work, which is on one hand, your opportunity to send out shout outs to touchstones in your own kind of reading and writing life. But I really do want to recognize um, it's so refreshing and so wonderful to see a writer that really makes it a point to name check and reference the work of others. Again, it's it's the when you read great writers, it's the gift that keeps giving it can be too much of a good thing because then one's reading list grows and grows and grows. But what, what better problem to have, right? That that's what I've been addicted to since I was little. So I always want more, but I can, and I always talk about the dog ear test. Um, <laughs> not a shortage of dog eared pages here, but boy, did you give me a lot of writers, some of whom I know, some of whom I've never heard of, but yeah, what a gift for a writer to, um, I, I can't remember the last time I read a collection of essays that that had so many references and meaningful quotes. But so I want to thank you for that. But maybe talk a little bit about your kind of methodology and, and why that's important to you. Sure, I think you know it feels very akin to breathing because everything I read, everything all of us read, you know, we take it in and we metabolize it, and it informs how we write. Certainly that's the case with me. And I love to acknowledge other writers, to celebrate other writers, because I learn so much every time I read. And I love being part of the literary community. And when I write, I don't, as much as I appreciate self-exploration on the page and as much 
as that has been so meaningful and important to me, I, do, I get tired of myself <laughs> and just writing about myself. <laughs> and um, being able to acknowledge other writers just feels so good. And uh, the essay We Too came about because I had written a novel and poems in the first person plural. And I started just being really interested in how other writers, especially women identifying and non-binary writers, had used that first person plural in their own work. And it was just such a fun exploration and celebration for me to dig into, um, into that form and how it's been used by a variety of writers. And of course, quoting them felt just really natural and significant to do. So that, um, yeah, that was a joy. And then um, like in a piece like um, Her Shadow, uh, and I'm trying to remember the subtitle. Something of portraits of my a portrait of my mother through portraits of other daughters' mothers or something like that. That's a found essay, and it was inspired by the the quote. And here I'm going to look for it just so I don't mangle it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a quote from Edwidge Dandekat's The Art of Death, which I had reviewed for the San Francisco Chronicle and really loved. And um, she, and this quote just really stood out for me where she writes, reading other daughters' accounts, I sometimes feel we are all the daughters of the same mythical mother. While I'm reading these other daughters' accounts, their mother has become my mother. And reading that gave me the idea of putting together an essay about my mom using other writers' words about their mothers. And that, that was a really fun and meaningful um, endeavor because it brought me back to books that had been meaningful for me. I read a lot of mother-daughter um, memoirs as I was writing my own or as, as, as I was trying to work up the courage to write my own and, um, and then continued to even after my memoir came out. And so I just started hunting for quotes that had the phrase my mother in them in these books that I loved and that was really fun and and gratifying and felt pretty profound to to be able to create that portrait of my mom through their mom's their words about their own mothers yeah yeah um for sure and and just a, a quick aside if i may um you know i find and i have long found a more feminist interpretation of kind of uh the literary impulse and 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 paying it uh, respects and 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 influence so much more satisfying. I remember first reading The Anxiety of Influence by Harold Bloom when I was an undergrad and thinking, what a bunch of horseshit like this. Talk about the patriarchy, this notion of we try to kill the ones that came before. It's like, first of all, the the violence, the, the posturing, this notion of respecting and embracing and acknowledging the myriad cultural sexual forces that inform our worldview is such a more generous and I think honest reading of what we do. However, and I and I can I can appreciate that this is a problem for any well-read writer. The more you read and absorb, the more one worries: Am I consciously or unconsciously imitating? And you tell a very um, wonderful and alarming anecdote where you recognize something in the great Margaret Atwood's writing where you think, did I, and you, and you find out you didn't, but what a, and I think a lot of people that tune into this series, uh, especially younger writers, they ask those questions all the time. Like, well, how do you avoid copying and how do you develop your own style? Those obviously are things that have to be cultivated over many years, but mm -hmm. talk a bit about that experience or just your, you talk specifically about the collective consciousness, which I, I love that meditation on how, of course, we're all, or certain people are examining certain things. So there's gonna be overlap, but hopefully we're doing it in original ways, but sometimes it's hard to do that. Yeah, it is. I'm. Um, this isn't mentioned in this book, but it just sprang to mind. Uh, my book, Fruit Flesh, Seeds of Inspiration for Women Who Write is a craft book that, like I look back and think I had a lot of hoods, but publishing a, a craft book about writing before I had published other books and before I was really known as a writer. But again, I was wanting to study or explore the connection between writing and the body. And I did that in that book as well. And 
at the time, there weren't any other craft books out about the connection between writing and the body. Um, people had written about it, you know, in, in essays and various things, but there wasn't a craft book. And I thought, oh, I have this, this fresh new approach. No one's ever thought to do this before. And um, when I was about 100 pages into it, and I was calling the book Writing from the Body at, in the early draft, uh, I saw an ad for a book called Writing from the Body that was coming out. And I felt so devastated because I felt like, you know, my fresh idea had been done and my life's work had been wrenched from me. And, and of course, that wasn't the case. And when I finally worked up the courage to read this book, I realized there was still space for my own vision and my own voice that, you know, you, you give a topic to a room full of writers and each one of them is going to write something different. And so I, I returned to that project with a slightly different focus. Um, I decided to focus on women's, women's bodies and women's writing because it's what I knew. Um, looking back, I, yeah, I might have um, made it a little less binary uh, <laughs> than it was, but I've learned since then. That was 2002. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think, you know, people will come up with similar ideas, but it's it's our own filter, our own particular breath that will make it unique, our own way of seeing the world. Um, my dad had this wonderful word that he coined, um, weirdity, which he used to describe our own inherent weirdness. And I think that that's, that's what we need to tap into as writers, yeah. even if we're not writing anything weird, but just our own our own weirdity that um, that's yep. what make our voice unique on the page. Even if we're writing something that's similar in theme or subject or um, era or whatever um, to some other writer, that yep. will that will make our work unique and alive. Yeah, that, for sure. And I, and I think you know you're talking also about you know the the power of writing as a connecting force and mm -hmm. um, the opportunity both for writers to write candidly about what they fear or what they don't know. And I think what invariably happens is readers who think they're the only ones that fear or don't know. So not only is learning achieved, there's this real connection. Um, and it can occur in, in multiple ways, but I think that's one way we all can and should celebrate writing as a real um, democratic force for sharing awareness, sharing mm -hmm. solidarity. And that transcends centuries and cultures and, and languages uh, yeah. in, such a, in such a powerful way. Yeah, I, I don't remember the quote exactly, but there's the wonderful James Baldwin quote where he says that, you know, you think that you're the only one who's experienced this pain in the whole history of the world, and then you read. And I think reading can help us feel connected to humanity. It can help us feel less alone in our our own pain or grief or solitude, um, loneliness, that that writing can be such a bridge and such a deep connection. Like you said, over time, like we can read something that's centuries old and feel that connection and feel, yeah, that inner world of that, that long dead person still speaking to our alive heart. And I think that that's, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. For sure. It's the maybe the most beautiful thing. Well, something that that everyone either shares and gets acquainted with or will be acquainted with is grief. Uh, you write so movingly about your mother and and grief. And I'd love you to talk a little bit about that if you'd like. But I also I want to kind of acknowledge and I, I wonder as I, I wondered as I was reading, I wonder now talking to you. How much of this is is a little bit unique to say a writer being a sensitive person that thinks deeply and is always making connections and seeing the world in metaphors. You describe what I or you you experience and describe the experience of what I would call pre-grief, which is you see something coming. And I do think that certain types of people feel these losses more deeply and earlier than people who are, you know, that react to the facts. Um, so without giving too much away, I want to just acknowledge that very succinctly in these essays, because they, they, these that could be a whole book of essays right there, 
grief and pre-grief and, and one's mother, but, but you really weave in your own personal story, but boy, speaking for myself and I'm millions of readers that would read this have been there, done that, of course, in very unique ways, but um, thank you for sharing your story because you're bearing witness and, and telling your mother's story through your own perception. And it's just, it's, it's shattering and it's also very moving. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm so grateful to have writing as a way of being able to work through grief and the pre-grief. And um, I, when I was growing up, or even as an adult, while my mom was still alive, I was the model I was given is that grief is something that I don't know. It it felt like this boulder that didn't move um, because my mom really she and of course grief doesn't go away it transforms over time but I I felt like it was this giant boulder that would crush me um every time my mom talked about her own mother she would cry and she could barely talk about it and I thought oh this is what grief is going to do to me I won't be able to talk about it I, I it will be beyond words and part of it is beyond words of course but but I've found that giving voice to it has helped me move through it. And it's not a boulder. It, it becomes various substances at different times. It's always there, but it changes. Sometimes it's lighter and sometimes it's heavier. Um, but writing really helped me so much through the process. And of course, there, you know, there are other ways to do this through therapy or just, you know, meditation. But for me, writing was it just helping me with my mom's suicide, I had so much anger toward her um, right after she died. And it was, which is normal in, in suicide loss. And uh, the writing helped me burn through that anger and get to a place of compassion for my mom. And I'm so grateful for that. And then it also helped me, um, I think the shock of my mom's death and then writing through it helped prepare me for my dad's death, which was a much less traumatic, as, as hard as it was and as desperately as I miss him, his death was a beautiful experience because you know, I could be there with him and with family and it wasn't the same sort of shock that my mom's death was. Um, and uh, yeah, I didn't think I would have to write about my dad's death too, but writing is how I how I process things so it did it has been sweet to write about his stuff well I you you said the magic word I was going to say that that your your writing on this topic invokes such tremendous compassion for me for you your family your mother um and and anyone that that has these struggles and again who doesn't we all are are facing our own battles or will um and again I I, I want to just give a shout out to the creators I think uh, you know, there are those that don't write. You, you, I, I'm with you, you know, as a writer, I, I share your gratitude to have these tools um, to try to make sense of the world and my own confusion at times. But I think the real, another gift is for, for people that don't write, never will write, don't want to write, the the writing that's been done is a way for those people to find solace or 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 understand that they're not alone. Um so again, it's so, it's such a profound gift to strangers to to write the kind of things you write about. Thank you. I know that after my mom's death, I was so hungry for other suicide loss narratives. I I couldn't read enough of them because I I wanted to see how people had survived it. I wanted to understand that it was survivable and that it was something one could write about. And those those books were a lifeline for me. They were a life raft. And I've since you know, heard from readers who have felt the same about my book, which means so much because it does feel like paying it forward um, yeah. because other books gave that to me. And if I can give that to, to readers, that means the world. Yeah. I, I always know that, uh, you know, I'm going to connect on some level with an author if I read their work or even just read an interview where they talk about what their goals are and when it involves things along the lines of if someone reads this and it helps them or if I'm able to connect with people. Because when you read about people 
and fame or fortune are some of the first things they bring up. Doesn't mean that they're not amazing writers or capable of empathic work, but tends to be the ones that have these genuine aspirations to connect. There's a kind of a baked in humility there. And it, it, it does, it's not a surprise that this is the work that, that tends to resonate emotionally and intellectually. Um, speaking of, uh, there's another topic um, it, you hit home, I'll describe a perfect encapsulation of a topic that could and maybe should in, in require an entire book. You talk about the tone and ecotone coming from the Greek tonos, meaning tension, and you describe transitional zones where stories haunt us and by writing them, allow us to set them free. I think this is such an extraordinarily rich and astute meditation on the whole craft of writing, the impulse of why we share, what drives us. So A, wow, thank you. But B, talk a little bit about that and this notion of um, these transitional zones and how that can lead to creativity. Yeah, yeah. An ecotone is a fascinating you know, landscape where it's where, you know, say desert and forest meet or whatever to, to uh, landscapes or biospheres meet. And it becomes this fruitful place where you can find animals that don't exist anywhere else other than these transitional places. And I think that, yeah, as writers finding, finding those moments of change, those, those moments of shifting within us um, are so fruitful and, yeah, and, and not just our own change, but like those little places in us that are haunted in some way, I think have something to say to us and and maybe will help us transition into a new phase in our life if we give voice to them. Um, and I'm a big fan of, yeah, just diving into those questions and stories that are haunting us, um, that are that we're fixated on, that we can't get out of our, our minds or bodies. Um, as a way of releasing them, moving on to that next zone, <laughs> moving out of that transitional space into whatever is next. Um, it's, yeah, interesting animals live there. <laughs> and, yeah. and we can, yeah. yeah, capture that on the page. But, but this notion of, of setting them free, I, I love how packed that is because I think it hits on, again, creative impulse or, you know, this notion of healing oneself by confronting which is something that would come up in therapy, something that comes up in creativity. It comes up in connection with loved ones, but also there's this beautiful kind of metaphor for, you know, writing and, or, or any kind of art where we don't know where some of these ideas come from. I think, you know, the literal of, yeah, we'll talk about things you want to know or that question or trouble you, but also this notion of the muse finding you and, and, and the writer channeling, these things that then resonate with other people. There's something that is so ethereal about that and powerful, and then it becomes palpable in the written word. So I just, I love that. I adore this notion of really excavating um, one's mind and heart and what comes out of that. Yeah, and it can be so freeing once we release those, those stories that have been just poking at us, prickling us, weighing on us, that yeah, that when we finally give them breath, give them space on the page, it it's so so liberating, so um, such a relief. I, I find that sometimes when I'm able to finally give words to to some inchoate feeling I've been carrying around, I feel so much lighter inside once I've gotten it out of my system. Yeah. First, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and again, I think I, on that level alone, I would recommend this book to uh, writers because there's a lot of craft talk. Uh, some of it subtle uh, and therefore more powerful, in my opinion. But there, there's a lot of nuggets uh, in here for writers trying to figure out, you know, how do I tackle or or how is this effectively done? Um, so again, kudos for that. Uh, you do something. You have a self interview. And you deploy a tactic that I don't think I've ever encountered. I love it so much, I may borrow it. You ask yourself a series of the same question and answer it different ways. Um, just props. How did that occur to you? And uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, 
There's a wonderful website, literary journal called The Nervous Breakdown, and they have they have this section of self-interviews and they asked me to do one for my memoir. And I wish I could remember my thought process during the time, but but that was the first uh, question, I guess, that occurred to me. Yeah. And then I realized I can answer this so many different ways. How did writing this memoir change you? It was like so many different ways and then in some ways not at all. And so I thought, okay, I will just answer this as many ways as I can and see, see what I can sort of wring out of this one question. And um, that was a really, uh, really illuminating process to do. Uh, Cause I think I had, I had sort of known how transformative it was, but I hadn't given voice to that. And I had also known that in some ways it hadn't changed me as much as I thought it did. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, just being able to, to kind of ask the same question over and over again and yeah, just see what emerged was, was fascinating and yeah, shed a lot of light on the process for me. Yeah, and, and, and speaking of craft, right? And I'm, of course, I, I note that you, you do teach. Um, what a what a wonderful exercise for uh, writers of any age that are stuck because in at 1455 another topic that comes up repeatedly because people want to hear about it is writer's block and and what do you do and how do you get the words every day just thinking about what do you want to change through this process whether this is stuff you keep mm -hmm. that's a thought stimulator what do you hope doesn't change and then for those of you that have written what has changed? What hasn't changed? What is the next project? Right there is, is a rich source of, of uh, rabbit holes a writer could go down on any project and probably surprise themselves, right? Uh, in terms of free write about that question, even before you've undertaken the project, and it might lead you in ways. So again, I think, uh, you know, anyone that picks up this book, you might be surprised at how many different uh, applications for creativity are contained here. Well, thank you. That would be awesome if this book leads to to writing, to you know, if it inspires other people to to just break themselves open. That would be amazing. It might inspire plagiarism because, like I said, uh, I just had a poetry collection come out and wanting to write about why did you do this? You know, what this project you're working on, like. Answering the same question a bunch of times is a very okay. novel no, way not, yeah. to attack, uh, you know, the writing. I would consider it plagiarism. I hope you'll do that. Well, it's and just such a it's such a neat way to be vulnerable, but also it's a really transparent way to say, "Here's what I'm trying to accomplish in my own words." So, um, great stuff. I would be remiss uh, whenever I have a writer that has either dabbled or mastered different forms, um, talking about the craft of poetry and memoir, and of course, essay. I, I would love to hear, I'm sure others would love to hear, of course, we know they're all different, and they all overlap, and a good writer senses, but I'm asked a lot, um, when do you know it's a poem, when do you know it's an essay, I'd love to hear you talk about, or uh, tell us, yeah. When do you know it's a poem? When do you know it's an essay? And 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 sometimes how do you, you don't know and et cetera, but talk a little bit about the overlap. Yeah, I often don't know if something wants to be a poem or an essay when I start, because I'll start with an image or I'll start with just a phrase that's stuck in my head or an idea. And I'll just start writing and I'll see where it takes me. And every once in a while, I'll I'll be clear that I'm writing an essay right now, um, such as when I decided to take what had been, you know, the book project of the five book and thought, I, this is an essay, I'm gonna write this essay. That was clear, although it started out in a different form. Um, but yeah, I, I think that pieces will reveal themselves as I write them. And sometimes they go in different ways than I would ever expect. Like I, um, I recently finished a new project um, it's very weird experimental, um, hybrid novel, uh, and it was, it's about the weekend that Marilyn Monroe spent in Lake Tahoe where I used to live, um, just before she died. And 
it got so weird and I had no idea it was going to get so weird. <laughs> and, um, there are so many rumors about what happened that weekend that she was in Lake Tahoe. And at first I chose kind of one of the rumors and went with that. And then and then the other rumors started creeping in and it turned into this multiverse thing that I wasn't expecting that at all. And um, so I think just kind of sitting with the piece and letting it become what it wants to become is always illuminating. I find that my writing is much smarter than my normal everyday self brain. <laughs> that if I if I kind of get out of my own way and allow the piece to breathe itself onto the page that eventually it tells me what it wants to be. And sometimes I'll play around with things like sometimes there will be a thing where I think it's an essay, but then I realized, no, I can boil this down into a poem. That's That would be a better form for this piece, that it just needs to be said in a very concise way. Um, or vice versa, this poem is spilling out of itself and needs to be something bigger. Um, like my novel, The Book of Dead Birds, started out as a poem, and then it, it turned into a novel. Um, so it's really, for me, a matter of listening to it, sitting with it, giving it time, allowing it to reveal its true self. Um, and that requires some patience and, and um, yeah, just some play too. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, Gail, what, what comes out, right? And I hope we've, we've somewhat addressed this evening. We, we only have so much time, but the, these are, again, such deeply thought pieces that come from a very astute mind but there's such a generosity, there's such a passion, and there's such a an obvious desire to connect and share for all the right reasons. Um, I don't see how anyone could come away from this book and, and not be inspired either to know themselves better, know their family better, uh, write more, or just find ways to focus on peaceful ways to kind of navigate all these tensions of life. I would love to have you have the last word and say, and the, the only other question that I always try to ask, uh, and I get asked a lot it, to, to ask writers, what do you tell someone that's hearing this and saying, this all is great, but she's done so much and she's so great. I'm just starting out. What, what words of advice and inspiration do you offer to a writer that thinks they might want to write? Yeah. Um, well, you use the word inspire, inspiration. and you know, as I explore in, in the title essay, the word inspiration literally means to breathe in. And so I think that, you know, inspiration is no further than a breath away. And my advice is to breathe in what's around you with not just your breath, but your senses, that if you're not sure what to write about, write about what's right in front of you with, with all your senses. Just start describing what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you can taste, even if it's just the inside of your mouth, what textures are around you. Um, that starting in that very sort of grounded place, grounded where you are, where, what you can breathe in, um, that's the place to begin and then let that spiral out into um, what, what feels most meaningful. Um, another simple uh, prompt that I often give my students is either start, just write, I want to write and see where that takes you. And it can be, I want to write about, and you can just you know start writing about what you want to write about, or I want to write because, and uh, that can sort of tell you what you want to write, or you can say, I'm scared to write about, or I'm scared to write because, and those can uh, kind of help trick you into writing about the thing you're scared to write about. So just those very simple prompts are a good way to get started. You hear that, folks? Wise words from a, a brilliant, generous, masterful craftswoman. Um, Gail, as predicted, I knew we'd fill an hour quickly. Uh, it, so leaves me with more, it leaves me with more questions, but I think we, we did the best we could tonight. I uh, don't want you to be a stranger. As I love to tell people, once you're part of the 1455 family, we, we keep you close. So we want to follow. Uh, I, I hope that this finds a wide readership. We will certainly do our part to promote it. And I just, I want to sincerely thank you for being here tonight and sharing uh, these observations with us, but also on a very personal level, Gail, I want to thank you for writing this book and, and all the things you do to promote connection uh, and inspire. Um, 
I'm a better person for having read this collection. And it's just been wonderful to chat with you. So let's do this again soon. Um, be well. And again, all the best wishes on the success of this book. Thank you so much, Sean. I loved talking with you. And I'm so grateful for all of your thoughtful questions and your generous words. And thank you for all you do with 1455. Well, it's my pleasure. It's a very selfish endeavor because I get to talk to amazing people. Um, but you made you made the work easy. And what what best compliment I can give you? Uh, it was a it was a genuine joy. So we will see you again soon. And folks, those of you that have checked us out tonight, thanks for being here. As always, we recorded this. We will put it on the website. We'll share it uh, via our social channels, and I will put abundant links so you can go to the Potter's House and buy your copy, and you can check out Gail's other work. So look at the 1455 website for more information about how to get more Gail Brandeis in your life. For now, everyone be well, be safe, be inspired, and don't forget to breathe. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you for being here. You.